Hi, I'm Fabio, and welcome to the sixth course about the Machine Learning Mathematical Foundation course series by MartechPost.com. In this course, we will wrap it up all the previous courses, and in particular, after uh, repeating what we have uh, uh, learned in the first course, in the first part of the first course, we will study in more detail how machine learning works in particular with a mathematical perspective. For example, in the first part of the first course, we understood why we should care about mathematics when talking about the machine learning. Well, for example, when everyone drives a car, but not everyone knows how to repair it. That's the same for machine learning. Uh, we can easily build a machine learning model and uh, sometimes make it work but uh, it's not easy to debug it when uh, the behavior is not what expected from that machine learning model or we can uh, we are not able to build a brand new mo a machine learning model maybe for a specific project if we do not know the math behind machine learning and uh, with this purpose in mind, we uh, started a particular path, a journey of six courses uh, that uh, will, will bring us from the machine learning basis to our deep understanding of this subject. What we have already covered in the previous courses was uh, a linear algebra, analytic geometry, calculus and statistics. In this course, we will do the last mile between us and a deep understanding of machine learning. For example, in the first course, we have studied vector spaces, a mathematical uh, the definition of a space in which we can do a simple and sometimes obvious operation between numbers and, uh, in a more general way, its elements and those elements are called vectors. A particular type of ma uh, vectors are the matrices, and uh, matrices are vectors in a multidimensional real space. Matrices are very useful, especially in machine learning, because through their compact notation they allow us to do a lot of uh, uh, computation in a single shot in a one-shot way. Thanks to the easy way we can program uh, um, operation between matrices and thanks to their notation. Finally, we have studied a particular set of vectors called bases that define the way we view the, that vector space. And in particular, using linear mappings, a special type of functions, we can change the perspective on uh, how we view the vector space and transform that basis. In the second course, we have studied analytic geometry. And everything started when we have defined the inner product operation. The inner product operation, talking about uh, analytic geometry, is crucial because allow us to take a vector space and induce some uh, op uh, geometrical operation and considerations. For example, through the definition of inner product, we can define the norms that uh, allow us to measure the length of vectors. And, uh, to, um, in, thanks to inner product, we can induce metrics, metrics uh, which allow us to measure the distance between two vectors. Also, uh, we can use inner products to define orthogonal projections. In particular, um, orthogonal projections um, take a vector and project M uh, to, onto a subspace. And the projection is uh, such that the uh, distance between the original and the projected vectors are at the minimum distance. 
Finally, we have seen uh, something, uh, some content about rotations. And in particular, we have described those kind of operations uh, through their linear map, describing their linear mapping and uh, taking a look to their transformation matrix. In particular, we have seen, for, a, uh, for example, for a 2D rotation, that the transformations ma transformation matrix is built with from sine and cosine elements. In the third course, we have a deep dive, some concept relate, related to uh, matrices. And uh, everything started with the, the determinant, the definition of a determinant which is a linear mapping that measures the way a linear map, uh, another linear mapping is uh, able to change the parallelepiped volume and how the vectors are stretched and rotated through that uh, linear mapping. And uh, th this uh, definition, this uh, particular function is crucial to understand linear transformation uh, better. In particular, we can uh, define eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and uh, those elements um, make us understanding linear transformation in an easy manner. Eigenvectors, for example, represent the direction along which a linear transformation acts, and uh, in particular, simply by stretching comp or compressing and or eventually flipping those vectors. We can leverage the concepts of eigenvectors and eigenvalues uh, by uh, building some uh, uh, algorithms that allow us to simplify matrices. In fact, uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors study uh, how we can describe linear transformation in an easy way. But matrices, in particular when they are transformation matrices, are linked with linear, uh, with linear transformation. So, we, thanks to uh, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors in particular, we are able to simplify a squared matrix by the egg, uh, you applying the eigen decomposition, in which transforms that uh, generic diagonal, uh, the uh, generic squared matrix, into a diagonal matrix, which are, is very si uh, uh, simple to understand and also uh, is easy to do uh, computation with it. But uh, the, uh, it's not uh, always possible to apply the eigen decomposition. So if we are uh, in the case of uh, squared matrix, uh, we can apply the Cholesky decomposition. Or when we are dealing with a rectangular matrix, we can apply the singular vector decomposition. Some alg uh, machine learning algorithms, in fact, are uh, built leveraging the concept of, of linear vector decomposition. In the fourth course, we have studied calculus, and starting by the definition of the limit, which is a particular function that um, uh, um, operation that allow us to analyze the behavior of a function when approaching a point not the, uh, the value of the function in that point, but the behavior of the function when approaching that point. So thanks to this notation, we can also characterize some particular functions that are regular, and uh, those functions are called continuous functions. Uh, since the limit allow us to study uh, um, how um, allow us to approach a point, we can study how a function changes when we approach that point, and uh, this can be done using uh, defining the derivative and uh, 
discovering the subject of differentiation. So differentiation le leverages the concept of limit to compute the infinitesimal variation of a function with respect to a point. A fundamental, a key concept of uh, differentiation is that the direction of the steepest ascent is the same direction as the gradient or the derivative depends on the, the, the number of dimension that uh, the domain of the function has. Since uh, the derivative is a linear mapping, we can uh, construct the inverse function of the derivative and this can be done defining the indefinite integral which comprises all the antiderivatives for a given function and a point. Another type of integral is called definite integral and uh, does uh, something we could say completely different and uh, in fact uh, it aims to compute the signet area under the function. These two type of integrals that can seem uh, quite different are linked together by uh, through the fundamental theorem of integral calculus. The last, uh, uh, we, the, the previous course uh, in, instead was the course 5, in which we have uh, talked about probability and statistics. We have described the probability as a measure onto a particular space uh, uh, called sigma algebra. And the sigma algebra, we remember, that is a collection of sets from a space, the sample space, that respect some useful properties about probability. So the probability is a measure um, that uh, measures elements in the sigma algebra and uh, the, it can be seen as a, me a measure of the randomness of the phenomenon. In fact, the elements of the sigma algebra are the events in which we compute the uh, probability. And uh, the events could be singleton, so single events, or compound events, a collection of multiple events. For example, if I roll a dice, the output 1 could be a singleton, a single event. If I consider the compound event an output that is less than 3, then I'm looking at an output of 1 or 2. But a random phenomenon can be described using a random variable that uh, the name can be mm, uh, strange when we look at the, the definition of random variable, which is a, a, a measurable function. And this measurable function uh, can be described using a probability distribution, a particular function that provides for any given point in the sample space, the space on to which um, the sigma algebra is built, the likelihood to see that sample. So if the random variable is discrete, for example, and we take an event from the sample space, then the probability distribution on that event, on that point, return to us the likelihood to see the sample, the probability of that uh, event. But uh, in uh, these first two points we are considering and we are describing the probability in a more abstract way. In reality, uh, we, have not, uh, we have not complete access to the sample space because we get a, a, a definite number of samples, an observable, an observed sample. And uh, the probability distributions uh, often have some parameters onto them. And uh, our goal to completely describe the phenomenon is uh, to uh, get to uh, 
uh, find the true parameters of that random variable. But this is not possible, so we need to approximate them using uh, the function called estimators. And these estimators are applied, in fact, to the observed sample. The estimators are very, very important when talking about machine learning and data science because um, uh, the estimators are often used during the EDA process, the exploratory data analysis process. So in this in this course, we will talk about we will uh, um, uh, get the last mile between us and a deep understanding of machine learning. And uh, to do this, we will talk about empirical risk minimization. And the empirical risk minimization is a statistical theory that formulates how machine learning models work, and in particular, how to measure their performance. So in the next uh, slides, we will learn how machine learning models learn and the complexity behind the, that training process. Uh, in, the, in this course, we will uh, take a, general over, um, a brief general overview about machine learning. We, will, uh, we have already covered this content, this, uh, this uh, first section, in the first part of the first course. So we will uh, see this content again, but in a very fast way. Second, we will describe how machine learning works. And the turn, finally, we will focus on supervised problems and we will uh, uh, describe them using a formal definition, uh, the math and uh, describing the supervised problem using a formal definition. And finally, we will take a look at how to validate a machine learning model and how to know or at least how to try to uh, train a good machine learning model and then to uh, uh, allow us to use that model on production with uh, a good performance.